unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. When it comes to the matter of relations between India and Pakistan, you've heard all of the familiar tropes. Two nuclear-armed rivals with hundreds of thousands of troops amassed along a contested border. A Hindu-majority India, predestined to be at odds with the Muslim-majority Pakistan. A vibrant democracy in the East, and a military-dominated polity in the West. But a new book by the historian Pallavi Raghavan offers a very different account about relations between these South Asian rivals in the immediate aftermath of partition in 1947. Contrary to the conventional doom and gloom narrative, Raghavan's book, Animosity at Bay, An Alternative History of the India-Pakistan Relationship, 1947-1952, to 1952, shows how amity and a spirit of cordiality infused relations between India and Pakistan in the first five years of their independence. To talk more about her book and the lessons it holds for today, Pallavi joins me on the phone from New Delhi. Pallavi, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So congratulations on the book, which I had the chance to read this past week. And I wanted to start by asking you a question about your motivations. So as you know better than I, there have been so many books written about the relationship between India and Pakistan over the years. But you went into this clearly feeling that something was missing. So tell us about, you know, what sparked your interest in focusing on these first five years of post-partition history? Yeah, you know, if I could just uh, tell you a little bit about the, you know, the the how, well, the history of this book getting written, it was actually, uh, you know, uh, this was my, this is essentially based on my PhD dissertation. And when I started my PhD, I, I, I mean, I, I, which was in a history uh, faculty, I was working with Joya Chatterjee, and I was looking at the impact of partition. Uh, the consequence, you know, the the way in which partition kind of affected the states of uh, the states and the state making processes in India and Pakistan. Um, and as I got further into, you know, into kind of uh, uh, you know reading about that, I realized that there was a really really interesting story to be told about the shaping of the two foreign ministries in the aftermath of of, of partition and how that process affected the you know the, the the broader dynamic of the india pakistan relationship itself um so i, I mean I, that, that's that's how i kind of uh, you know got into this and also i mean as I, as i uh, as i was writing and researching uh, uh, around this you know around around partition in the 1950s and the the, foreign, the early foreign ministries of india and pakistan one of the things that struck me was that you know there is a huge amount written about india pakistan relation i mean there's no question you know there's there's, there's bookshelves and bookshelves and incidentally there is a huge amount written about the partition uh, uh, as well uh, but one of the things that struck me that you know that 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 that, that there is a story to be told about the uh, that the india pakistan relationship, the history of the relationship can be told from a more rigorously historicized kind of perspective, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which takes into account or which kind of, uh, which, which takes into account archival uh, research more, which also takes into account the points of view and the stake, you know, a, a broader kind of set of stakeholders in the shaping of the relationship and which uh, work with a more you know, um, the contingencies of history, uh, which tries to kind of accommodate those sorts of uh, considerations too in the shaping of the relationship. So I thought this particular time period, the, you know, the early nine, uh, early 1950s and the late 1940s, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the study of, you know, a partition also enabled me to tell a slightly different story about the history of the India-Pakistan relationship. So, you know, I'm glad you raised this issue of method because what the book does is it makes clever use of what were previously untapped archives and papers. So tell us a bit more about the new material that you were able to unearth while conducting research for the book. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, there, I did use a lot of uh, archival material that hadn't been uh, previously, uh, you know, declassified, and which related to a lot of, you know, uh, which related to the the uh, papers of the Ministry of External Affairs. 
you know, from the uh, early, uh, the late 1940s and the early 1950s. And a lot of those papers were, were declassified as I was, you know, as, as, as uh, quite recently, and were also incidentally published, uh, published, you know, uh, in uh, a, a kind of uh, a set of volumes called by, uh, edited by a person named A.S. Bhaseen, who put together like a 10 volume kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, a documentary study on the his on the uh, you know uh, the uh, papers relating to India's uh, you know relations with its neighbors. Um, so uh, and and uh, these you know and uh, you know I, I also used material from the National Archives of India, from you know the the uh, Public Records Office and the British Library and the uh, National Archives in 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 Dhaka. Uh, as well as you know, as well as, as well as a whole lot of uh, memoir uh, and uh, and newspaper kind of uh, literature from the time, and uh, you know, uh, so and 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 all this enabled me to kind of incorporate a broader set of voices into the you know the story of how the relationship is molded. Like I, I mean, what this enabled me to do was to sort of say that look, it was you know I I I got an understanding of how it wasn't simply Nehru. Right, or it wasn't simply Liaquat Ali Khan or Jinnah uh, who just single-handedly kind of dictated policy or dictated foreign policy. What I got a sense of was that there's that there's there's also you know various sorts of institutional uh, factors at work and various sorts of you know uh, uh, I mean and by institutions I mean kind of uh, you know foreign policy uh, foreign ministry uh, their institutional logic as well and a lot of you know uh, bureaucrats journalists. Uh, politicians uh, and uh, civil society actors. The, these kinds of people were also quite instrumental in determining the direction in which the relationship would go. So, you know, if I focus on the central argument of your book, Pallavi, it's that, you know, there is an alternate history of the India-Pakistan relationship, particularly in those early years, that is premised on, you know, reciprocal acts of bilateral engagement, comedy, cooperation, I'm wondering, you know, as you were going through this material, were you were you surprised at the degree to which the two sides sought to work together to deal with mutual challenges, you know, in this wake of the kind of this enormous traumatic bloodshed that racked the subcontinent? I mean, did, did that catch you off guard? Yes, definitely. And, you know, one the reason it caught me off guard is because all this, you know, all, all that I read about the India-Pakistan uh, relationship and all the secondary, uh, so, uh, you know, literature that was available seemed to suggest that this was you know a, 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 it's a kind of cut and dried you know zero sum you know a, a zero sum game kind of simple story you know where it's it's an either or kind of story and that there was you know and, and, and that this and, and that this is how you know that these are these two enemy uh, countries and one wins or the other loses and that's 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 basically all there is to be told about the uh, the history of this relationship and given the prepont you know the the kind of amount of of uh, literature there is that kind of characterizes the the relationship like this given that you know it's 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 it, it's it's kind of dominant in the field uh, i was surprised to find that there's a i mean it's not as if it, i mean it, 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 that there's a there's also a considerable kind of extent of uh, discussion and dialogue and kind of you know uh, and uh, and a, a constructive approach to the shaping of the relationship i mean that kind of uh, that kind of approach to bilat uh, the making of the bilateral relationship also existed so i was surprised to find a you know a, 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 i mean a fairly dense amount of archival material which kind of uh, testified to uh, people taking a pretty kind of you know, a practical, a practical and problem-solving approach to uh, different aspects of the relationship, which you know, which which excluded, uh, you know, which excluded Kashmir. But if you look at other issues in the relationship, like evacuee property, or the question of minorities, or the question of boundary drawing, or the question of boundary delineation, or the question of water sharing, or the question of trade. All of which are, in a sense, equally 
kind of uh, you know uh, if equally as equally significant uh, to you know people's lives in south asia as the question of as the question of kashmir uh, there's a, there was there was a, a lot of kind of very constructive dialogue on on these issues so i was i, I mean i i realized that there was a, a a kind of a story to be told about this and secondly the other thing i felt was that you know because again so much of the present day kind of enmity between india and pakistan kind of is 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 uh, based on or it bolsters itself on to the wrongs of partition and to the memory of you know bitterness over partition and so much of what you hear about you know why do you hate you know the other is to do with well they you know uh, is to do with kind of embittered stories uh, from uh, a refugee families or embittered stories uh, over those who felt betrayed over the uh, uh, transfer of power negotiations or embittered stories about you know the the fairness of the accession of kashmir all of which are in a sense located inside the story of partition given that so much of your justifications about uh, you know uh, 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 justifying hostility towards the other are based on uh, uh, you know uh, narratives of partition i realized that you know that that this this other fact that in the aftermath of this partition it's a of this very same partition that there's a great deal of cooperation station and dialogue would seem to belly or contradict the sources of justifications that are used in order to you know to to give validity to the argument that there ought to be uh, uh, you know enmity or hostility between india and pakistan so let me get to the real substance of the book and when you get to the first substantive chapter it focuses on these arrangements that both india and pakistan developed to to help address this kind of mutual security dilemma that they faced right and so you write in that first chapter that the necessity of creating state infrastructure to deal with the horrors of partition was really based on the necessity of recognizing quote unquote the other uh in terms of you know uh, each of these countries were sovereign functioning kind of barbarian states and that this in turn helped to create possibilities for collaborative dialogue where none had existed before so i'm wondering if you could give us some examples kind of in lay person's terms how, what did this actually look like you know in the aftermath of partition yeah you know I, I, one of the things that the book tries to do is to show that in the first 5 years that followed the partition one of the kind of assumptions that went into a lot of policy making or a lot of you know uh, uh, that kind of accompanied a lot of policy makers was that uh, again like that that partition itself you know is a was a was in their eyes a perfectly kind of viable and perfectly uh you know uh, you know uh, sort of it, it it was this administrative device that had been used in other places around the world many many times before and just that fact itself wasn't necessarily enough to justify the shaping of a of a, a, a distrust for a hostile bilateral relationship between india and pakistan Uh, you know so having coming come out of partition there was also every expectation that you know this this doesn't need to add up to a bad end right and it doesn't need to add, add up to uh, to uh, to something that that shows that we are kind of doomed from the beginning in terms of having to have a a, a, a mistrustful relationship there's also every reason in the world to think that look if you do solve uh, the, the, the you know the the uh, outstanding issues from the partition then you can have a perfectly stable relationship i mean kind of uh that kind of assumption was also present i think in the shaping of the bilateral relationship in the 50s and so in the immediate aftermath of partition in 1948 the, you know 47 there was you know on the question of for example abducted women or on the question of uh you know uh, people who were fleeing the punjab in in in, in enormous numbers across both sides uh, over what essentially amounted to like ethnic genocide um or even over you know the 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 kind of setting up of the foreign ministry is itself uh there was in uh, what uh, all these instant i mean uh, you know uh, many of these instances were kind of uh, accompanied you know were accompanied by a great deal of violence you know and a great deal of uh, kind of trauma uh, and 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 people as i say like people still remember it with a lot of pain today but 
what you know uh, the, the, and 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 in many instances you know uh, at, at 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 local levels were dealt with in a in a, in a typically kind of ha- ham fisted and clumsy kind of uh, way by bureaucracies of south asia which are known for for for, for, for being like you know for, for doing that and so if you look at the abducted women story for example what you have is are two very patriarchal and very uh, kind of uh, you know uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, very uh, insensitive states almost you know that 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 brook very little dissent or disagreement who were determined to kind of reclaim the, the 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 as they told as they kind of understood it reclaim women who had been kind of you know dishonored by the partition even though the women themselves were repeatedly saying you know many different things uh, that didn't necessarily fit in very clear uh, cleanly with their own narrative about this yet at the same time given this uh, i mean uh, what what i also try to track in the chap- uh, you know in this in the book is that um is that there was a curious kind of cooperation and there was a curious kind of uh, you know a uh, uh, you know a process in which both sides worked agreed to work in tandem uh, over this whole question uh, which really posed very, very, you know, which posed very difficult questions as far as the, 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 you know, the, the making of the personalities of India and Pakistan were concerned. You know, the, the story of abducted women kind of seemed to uh, pose very difficult questions about that. And yet, when faced with this kind of common challenge around, you know, arising from the partition, there was a way in which both governments actually chose to collaborate with one another over abducted women. And the reason for doing that was not because they were rejecting the premise of partition. It's because they were actually trying to entrench it even further. So you've got two governments that tell these women very firmly that, look, partition has happened. This has, you know, this experience is done. Now you need to come back and become Indian or Pakistani citizens. And what you're what you're seeing in this in this whole kind of uh, process is how there's a way in which India and Pakistan were actually collaborating and cooperating in their attempts to finalize the partition or in their t- attempts to give shape and meaning to the process of partition and this this kind of uh, collaboration which you know which was uh, you know which, which was there on the question of abducted women but you also see variation of this this kind of approach to cooperation in a whole lot of other kind of issues that she that 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 you know that face the relationship at the time like evacuee property or like migrant minorities or like uh, trade or like boundary drawing that 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 to the extent that there is cooperation is based on the necessity of recognizing the fact that partition has happened and that partition the fact that partition has happened doesn't necessarily add up to the fact that there needs to be a bad relationship at the end of it so the Nehru Liaquat Pact was an agreement signed in 1950 under which both governments committed themselves to protecting the interests of minorities in their respective countries. And, you know, this has found its way back into the news 70 years later because its failure was used as a pretext for the Modi government's push for a new citizenship amendment bill that would grant expedited citizenship to persecuted religious migrants who found their way to India. So before we get into the contemporary relevance of the pact, Tell us a bit about how this came to be. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, as you're saying that the the, the Nehru Liaquat Pact kind of uh, seemed to make its way back into the newspapers recently when it was kind of brought up by Amit Shah repeatedly in Parliament uh, d- during the 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 uh, you know debates about the citizenship bill, and uh, what the Nehru the, uh, the Nehru Liaquat Pact itself was signed in 1950 April in Delhi. Uh, between the two prime ministers, uh, you know, uh, India, uh, Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan, uh, on the issue of minorities, uh, and on the issue of minorities in particular in the Bengal uh, basin, and what had actually happened was that, uh, you know, uh, in the closing months of 1949 and in early 1950, there was a, uh, you know, there was a, 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 a enormous refugee crisis that threatened to, uh, you know, in 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 the in eastern uh, in the eastern sector, i.e., West Bengal, East Bengal, Assam, Tripura, uh, you know, uh, 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 the 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 Bengal basin was was uh, the, uh, was uh, 
threatened by a huge, uh, you know, a huge, huge influx of uh, Hindus fleeing from East Pakistan and Muslims fleeing from West Bengal in enormous and unsustainable numbers. And incidentally, fleeing from East, pa East uh, West Bengal to East Pakistan and also fleeing from the, uh, you know, other parts of India into West Pakistan. Uh, so there's there's a huge amount uh, there's an enormous refugee crisis and this kind of comes to a head in Bengal uh, in in the last months of 1949 and which dangerously threatens the stability of both uh, Nehru's and Liaquat Ali Khan's government because in situations like this what tends to happen is that you, you know you've got these state uh, very very powerful provincial chief ministers like. B.C. Roy, like, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as well as a whole, uh, Gopinath Bardolai, as well as a whole host of others who uh, threaten, you know, who threaten the stability of their central government by saying that, look, um, you know, uh, we're, we're engulfed by these millions of refugees and we can't afford to feed them and we can't afford to rehabilitate them. And they're coming because the central government hasn't taken a strong enough kind of stance against Pakistan. And, uh, the, you know, this is, in a sense, their fault. And so either the central government uh, should do something in order to stop these refugees coming in such enormous numbers. Uh, incidentally, the, 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 the state government of M.A. Khuro in Sindh had also fallen on in 1948 over the, precisely the same refugee issue. So, uh, and there, thereby threatened the stability of the central government in Pakistan. But so these, uh, these, these chief ministers say that, look, either you do something about it and stop these refugees from coming, or you give us, uh, you know, or you give us more money to be able to rehabilitate these these uh, refugees. And if you don't do either of these things, then we can make it very difficult for your political survival to continue. So in this situation, there's a way in which there's a kind of commonality of interest between Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan, you know, the two prime ministers, to come to, you know, in order to be able to kind of ensure the survival of their governments, there's a, I mean, there's a, there's a kind of uh, instrumental reason that they come together to, uh, to, uh, to, to thrash out what ought to be done about the refugee situation in Bengal. And so what they decided to do was to sign the Nehru Liaquat Pact, uh, which actually was a, was a, was, was, you know, again, if you think about the, the, the dynamics of, uh, South Asia, you know, South Asian politics, it's actually quite an unusual kind of uh, agreement because what it uh, provided for was that the uh, government of India would be legally accountable to the government of Pakistan as far as the, the question of its minority citizens in, in Bengal was concerned, and the government of Pakistan would be legally accountable to the government of India as far as the minority situations and is, uh, minority uh, you know communities in East Pakistan were concerned. So, uh, so what I mean, you know, uh, what was needed was uh, you know was a strong enough statement to be able to reassure the minority communities on either side of the Bengal boundary line to stay in place. And the way Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan did that was to say that, look, we will both le be legally accountable to each other to ensure your uh, to ensure your your, your well-being. So in case your communities are threatened, uh, the government of, of, you know, the governments that you're, that, that uh, you know, we are, we are, uh, we have the right to be able to take this up with the, with the other government. Um, so the, this this type of agreement was was signed, and it you know now it it, it was um, it had patchy degrees of success. Uh, what it I mean it it, it did ensure uh, or it did help to ensure the return of thousands of families back across the boundary line. It did kind of give uh, you know assuage the 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 kind of security concerns of minorities in in west in bengal for the time being and it also most importantly warded off the the kind of prospect of war between india and pakistan for the time being so although it i mean it it, it, it didn't i mean although it, it it didn't kind of obviously it didn't um, you know rectify the situation of minority persecution in, in south asia once and for all it came nowhere close to being able to do that at all but at the same time for the time being it served its purpose and this was 
on you know in the end a story about how uh, uh, you know it was possible to kind of come to some kind of compromise and uh, and uh, you know agreement uh, between india and pakistan uh, rather than facing the situation of war i mean i think that's why the discussion of it is so interesting right because we're in a new cycle where this pact has been kind of dredged up often with very little historical context and been criticized but you know in your book you write and i just want to quote that the pact went some way to avoid the breakout of war between the two countries over the question of uncontrollable numbers of refugees flowing across the Bengal boundary, end quote, right? And so despite the fact that many contemporary commentators are criticizing the accord, you know, no less a figure at the time than Sardar Patel said he had looked everywhere, high, low, and vain for an alternative. And there basically wasn't any, right? So um, I, I feel like we, one of the things the book does is to say, look, this pact may not have solved every issue under the sun, but <laughs> yeah, it, it was successful insofar as it stopped war from breaking out, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, one of the really interesting things about this pact was that, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a sign between Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan in, in 1950, and it caused a huge amount of opposition in in Nehru's uh, cabinet. And, uh, you know, uh, the politician, the Bengal politician S.P. Mukherjee and K.C. Niyogi uh, resigned from, from, from the cabinet in protest against this, uh, against this pact. And it was Sadar Patel, who went and you know sort of sold this uh, the idea of this pact to the people of Bengal and you know I, I mean that sentence that you read like it's it you know the the the, the 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 kind of language that he used will also strike many kind of uh, you know followers of India Pakistan relations today as being curiously kind of familiar because he's saying that look what is the option you know I mean that 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 Pakistan is there it's a neighbor you have to you know you you, you have to kind of deal with neighbors this is what we've come up with and this is the best there is you know so he he try he he goes and 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 enables the pact to kind of uh, actually work and also the, the you know the, the other reason that this pact is 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 really kind of uh, interesting is well uh, i mean w- one of the things about it is, is that it you know it, it it wasn't necessarily a failure i wouldn't call it a failure i mean what it you know the, the way in which it's being described now is that it was just this kind of you know spineless thing that was done in the 1950s and i, I you know uh, uh, what comes across in, in the writing or the discussion about the bengal pact is that you know it, 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 the, there was a, a, a many reasons to hope that this could kind of fix the situation for at least a little while. Like there was a lot of expectation attached to this pact, and the other re- reason that this pact is so interesting is because you know one of the things that it seems to point to is that um, you know th- that there were all kinds of uh, different um, kind of. Uh, uh, expectations about what about what sovereignty would entail in South Asia, and you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, because uh, in the end, what the pact seemed to do was to kind of was to kind of compromise with the idea of uh, you know of, of an exclusivist kind of sovereignty uh, of the governments of India and Pakistan, because in the end, this was a pact that said that look. The government of India will be legally accountable to the government of Pakistan and vice versa. And, you know, I mean, again, like if you think about it, it, it this this kind of thing is a particularly strange in a setting where it's such as South Asia, where the governments of India and Pakistan are notoriously prickly about, you know, retaining their, you know, about being seen to be absolutely so- sovereign in their realm, uh, about being seen to be, you know, two sovereign kind of uh, states. And B, what I mean, because you know, what it kind of uh, allowed uh, a, a, a some amount of dilution of was the, was the was this whole idea that look, as far as the government is concerned, what it does to its people inside its boundary line is only its concerns, right? That definition of sovereignty is somewhere tested uh, by the Nehru Liaquat Pact, or is somewhere kind of uh, diluted a little bit by the Nehru Liaquat Pact. And w- what I'm trying to get at when I, you know, when I kind of discuss this in the chapter, is that this again is is an example of how, you know, th- this is another kind of equally viable way of thinking about uh, the ways in which it's uh, if it's possible to productively uh, uh, kind of work together in the aftermath of a partition. 
right? I mean, what you you know uh, uh, what was sort of said during the Nehru Liaquat Pact to the to the minorities, it wasn't said that look, it just pretend as if partition has never happened and 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 uh, pretend like you're uh, citizens of the erstwhile realm. No. Instead, they were told firmly that, look, you are citizens of India and Pakistan, but this kind of, uh, and, and, and uh, this is what it means when you are going to be citizens of India and Pakistan. And also the governments of India and Pakistan can be uh, accountable to one another as far as their minority uh, communities are concerned. So this kind of approaching uh, approach to shaping uh, a, a kind of joint sovereignty was, in a sense, possible only after the partition, right? And was, in a sense, a product of the partition. And it's a it's a way in which we can think, you know, we can sort of it's a it, it's an example of how you can approach the question of whether or uh, you know uh, approach the question of what kinds of things are possible for states to do after partition. And this is an equally good example of that. I mean, one of the other interesting things you bring out in the book is that for many, many months, Nehru and Liaquat corresponded about the creation of a so-called no-war pact between the two countries. And ultimately, they could never really see eye to eye. But it's still kind of remarkable that they spent, you know, 11 months, almost one year trying to get to yes, right? And and you talk about the fact that this idea of a no-war pact was modeled after the failed interwar kellogg briand pact, which was a 1928 agreement that outlawed war. Or right on paper, we all know how that turned out. In fact, several of the innovations around reconciliation that India and Pakistan both explored during this early post-independence period kind of harkened back to these models that had been tried out in Europe in the interwar period. But, you know, many of these models failed. So why did Nehru think that, you know, maybe this time something would be different? Yeah, you know, again, uh, the 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 no war pact stories again. Like, I mean, it's it's interesting because uh, you know what I seem to what I kind of uh, gleaned from uh, from from the study of those papers was that this was almost entirely an exercise of uh, propaganda. You know, I mean, I don't think I, I think uh, you know, at the at the start of the pact, like I mean, the the pact itself was started in 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 1949, roughly around the time of the refugee crisis, and uh, around the start of the refugee crisis, and at the start of the pact, it kind of it may have looked possibly like this could this might have been something that 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 could lead to kind of a, a, a bet you know some kind of compromise between India and Pakistan or some kind of you know deal between India and Pakistan on the refugee question. Uh, if that that kind of expectation is very 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 quickly kind of. Uh, dispensed with, and instead Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan they signed the Nehru Liaquat Pact instead, right? Uh, 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 but as far as the, the the correspondence being able to kind of secure a deal on the question of minorities is concerned, that kind of uh, that is uh, you know that doesn't materialize. But even though it doesn't materialize, they kind of keep at the correspondence. They kind of keep having the correspondence, and they keep going over all the issues that are that that. Uh, you know that are what, what they called outstanding uh, from partition in the India-Pakistan dynamic in the India-Pakistan relationship, like water, like evacuee property, like uh, trade, like um, you know uh, Kashmir, and like uh, the the you know the the the, the question of boundary uh, boundary line. So they, they they continue to have you know they, they continue to, to kind of write about it to each other, even though it becomes it's it's clear from quite early on that it's not actually going to result in any well in result in any no war pact, uh, you know uh, uh, which uh, was this uh, was this kind of concept which you know as you are saying like they they, they kind of. Uh, it borrowed from interwar Europe, which was this this kind of agreement that neither would declare war on the other in the first instance over these these questions. Now, so the question then arises: is why you know if if it's clear that it's not going to kind of yield to this new war pact, then why is it the, why is the correspondence entered into in the first place? And one of the reasons that they were doing this was to kind of tell the world about the, the fact that they were doing this. So I want to bring this conversation to a close by asking you to reflect on one of the conclusions you draw from your research, which is, you know, if you look back at the late 40s, 1950s, there was this enormous sense of what was possible in terms of the capacity of the state, what state institutions, what state bureaucracies, what state administrations could actually accomplish. 
And I'm wondering, as you kind of step back and and think about where India-Pakistan relations stand today, you know, does, or I guess how much does the declining power of the state kind of explain the differences between the approaches the two countries took way back then and the approaches that they seem to be pursuing today? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I talk about this a little bit uh, in, in, you know, in the conclusion of the book. And one of the things that kind of that do strike me is that, look, you know, is that, um, it, you know, is that obviously I, that, 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 that there is some kind of, uh, there is some kind of uh, linkage or there is some kind of parallel in terms of how strong, you know, what are the expectations about the responsibilities and duties and capacity of the state and the strength of the relationship as a whole. And there's, I mean, I think there's some kind of, you know, there, 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 there's, a, there, there's a reason that the the, the early 19, the, the late 1940s and 50s uh, are so particular. I mean, one explanation it might be to do with the fact that the state capacity, you know, that the the, uh, the, the expectation of, about what a state ought to do for its people was much higher during these decades, and you you know it kind of it corresponds with a more kind of stable approach to uh, decision making as far as uh, you know as far as bilateral relations are concerned. And the other, and as I said, like the other kind of, uh, uh, in, you know, the, the other thing about this is that it, it, this is worth bearing in mind because if there's so much, you know, uh, so much of um, kind of emphasis or weightage given to, uh, you know, the, the, the bitterness about the partition time and its aftermath, if that... Uh, Time is remembered so uh, so kind of harshly today as a way of, of of kind of justifying why the states the weakened states of India and Pakistan ought to have a a, 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 a more combative relationship with one another. Then it's I mean uh, then then this, this this story about cooperation and collaboration in the 1950s it's it, it sends it sends a I mean it. it, it uh, it's it's an important kind of reminder of the fact that it was this generation, after all, that had witnessed the worst of the horrors that South Asian politics could throw at them, or the, the current times, you know, are perhaps like a close second. But certainly at the time, in the 40s, like they, they suffered over, South, you know, over, uh, over uh, you know, uh, partition, like they, they suffered over communal rights, they lost property, they lost women, they, 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 they really had a very bleak time. And it was those same people, those same actors who got together on negotiating tables after the uh, partition and tried to figure figure out ways forward. So if if those people could do it, uh, then, uh, you know, then then there's there's no re I mean, there's no reason that it shouldn't be, you know, I mean, it, it, it's an important kind of uh, arg argument, uh, then that argument ought to be taken into account as far as the shaping of the relationship is concerned today. And the reason those people did it is because they thought that yeah, this is this this is what states do. This is what uh, states ought to do, and that it's the responsibility of the state to do this. So that kind of expectation, I think, uh, was probably on the whole good for the making of the, the shaping of the relationship. My guest on the show today is Pallavi Raghavan. She's an assistant professor of international relations at Ashoka University and the author of a brand new book called Animosity at Bay, an alternative history of the India-Pakistan relationship, 1947 to 1952. Pallavi, congrats again on the book. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We're speaking at a time of lockdown and quarantine. So uh, I appreciate you uh, taking some time out uh, and to talk to us on the phone. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Grant Thamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week.